Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Judith Sears Poisson, and I'll be your host today. Our webinar is on recognizing the diversity of fathers and families in child and family services. And we have four great presenters who will share their research on and experience with strategies to effectively serve Black fathers and Latino fathers in father-specific services, and also alongside mothers in services for children and families. Just to give you a sense of how our hour uh, will, be, will be organized, first off, we'll hear from Dr. Tova Walsh, who's an assistant professor in the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's also an IRP affiliate. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Daryl Davidson. He's the Community Engagement Director for the City of Milwaukee and Director of the Milwaukee Fatherhood Initiative. Then we'll hear from Dr. Alvin Thomas, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at the School of Human Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, also an IRP affiliate. And then our last speaker will be Dr. Christina Mogro-Wilson. She's a professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Connecticut and is also a faculty member in the Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Project. So thank you all for being here, our attendees and our panelists. This webinar is co-produced with the Wisconsin Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Board. I also want to acknowledge the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services for their partial support of this webinar series through their funding of IRP as the National Research Center on Poverty and Economic Mobility. So we have an hour today, and after we hear from each of our presenters, we'll spend the last 10 minutes or so at the end for a live Q&A. You can type questions in through the Q&A box, and we did get quite a few questions submitted as people registered, so we'll also be queuing up some of those as well. I hope you'll feel free to participate through the chat as well. We'd love to hear from you through that. And I want to let you know that we do have closed captions enabled, so you can toggle those on and off at the bottom of your screen. We'll be posting the slides and the recording of the webinar within a day or so. And because you registered, you'll receive a link to those by email. So with that, thank you all again for being here. And we'll get started with Professor Walsh. Thanks so much, Judith. And thanks to IRP and the Prevention Board for hosting another webinar in our series on fatherhood. So I'm really excited to be joined by three fabulous co-presenters and to get to spend the next hour with you. Um, I will kind of skip over this slide Judith outlined for you just a few key takeaways about what, where we're headed in this uh, next hour together. And so what I want to start by doing is just framing our conversation a little bit. We've had uh, earlier webinars in this series where we talked in more depth about the many contributions and unique contributions that fathers make to children's development. But as we move into thinking about uh, engaging, recognizing the diversity of fathers and child and family services and how we can engage fathers, um, I want to just start us off by reminding us why this is so important. And that is because fathers play such a crucial role in the lives of their children and families. And so broadly, we can just summarize a whole, you know, really extensive body of literature by saying that positive father involvement is associated with um, developmental, you know, positive developmental outcomes for children really across the lifespan and in many domains. And so that is one of the things that really motivates those of us who are presenting today in the work that we do and in thinking about how we can better support fathers and families. So uh, not only do fathers play a critical role within their families, but fathers' participation in services for children and families uh, also has really important effects for children and families. So across a, a number of different areas of services, so including permanency planning and parenting training, Head Start in schools, also research on fathers' involvement in prenatal care and in pediatric care, we see improved child outcomes when fathers are involved alongside mothers and children in services for families. And so that really kind of grounds our, our focus today in thinking about how we can support fathers' engagement and recognizing that different fathers are going to have different needs and be coming from different community and cultural contexts. And so thinking about what different fathers um, might be looking for and might be responsive to what barriers different fathers might face is kind of where we're headed in this next hour. So uh, a few things that I want to say about recognizing the diversity of fathers and families and child and family services is, is first just to start by acknowledging that our cultural values and beliefs shape how we parent. Uh, and so it, I think a really important thing for all of us in our own parenting, but also for those of us who work with parents and with families to think about 
you know, what shapes our own beliefs and, and the backgrounds that, that we bring, the assumptions that we have and, and, you know, norms that we grew up with around what parenting looks like, about what parenting by mothers and fathers looks like. And, you know, to have our own kind of self-awareness about the beliefs that we bring, and then also to be attentive to learning about and, and taking the time to understand and appreciate the different values and beliefs, cultural values and beliefs that shape the perspectives of fathers who we might work with in services. And so I want to recognize that norms and expectations for fathers vary both within and across communities. So we'll talk about some of the ways that in specific cultural contexts there might be particular norms, but also recognizing that within groups there are lots of differences in terms of how people want to parent, what they were raised to expect in terms of what the role of a father might be, uh, as well as acknowledging that within and across communities there are often stereotypes or biases held about fathers and fatherhood and father engagement. So those might vary across communities, but also within communities, the ways that people think about you know, father's capacity to parent, whether fathers are um, meant to be providers or protectors or both, just how expansive we are in thinking about the role of a parent, um, the role of a father as a parent and what that can encompass, um, what's expected of mothers versus fathers and how that differs or doesn't differ or our openness to, you know, to thinking differently about fatherhood and what it might look like. So as, you know, kind of a first and foundational principle, I think just a critical thing to do is to get to know the fathers you're serving. So get to know fathers in the context of their communities and their cultures, get to know individual fathers and what their circumstances look like and the goals that they have for themselves, whether it's wanting to parent in ways like they were raised, whether it's wanting to do things differently, but understanding and, you know, what fathers are, are looking for and hoping for in their own parenting. Um, uh, in one of our earlier webinars, we talked about some of the barriers to father engagement and services, and I want to just revisit this and emphasize thinking about how some of these barriers um, can also be connected to thinking about the diversity of fathers and families. So when we think about you know, beliefs that we might hold around what a father-child relationship means, whether it's a primary relationship, a secondary relationship, whether we think about father's participation in services as you know, essential or as optional, and um, you know, keeping in mind that norms are going to vary within uh, within cultural groups, within communities, within families about um, you know what expectations are for fathers. But when we hold these beliefs that fathers are not essential or that their participation is secondary, and um, that can become a self fulfilling prophecy. So thinking about as providers how we can disrupt those beliefs in ourselves, challenge those beliefs if we're hearing them from families that we're working with, and um, and you know, really reinforce the contribution that fathers make. And how important and necessary their participation is not only in their children's lives but in services that fathers bring a unique perspective if I'm a home visitor working with a family I'm going to hear some things from mothers and some things from fathers if a, if a child is being raised by a mother and a father because they each have a unique relationship with that child and engage differently and see different things and the more I can get information from both parents about what they're seeing, what they're worried about, what they're proud of, what they're, uh, you know, what they want to celebrate in terms of their relationship with their child, that's going to give me a more holistic picture to be able to support a child and a family. So, uh, you know, keeping in mind, uh, you know, as we kind of move through this webinar that, you know, that we may face barriers in our, in our work and also, uh, oops, that was, was not quite the order I was uh, intending. Um, you know, also keeping in mind that, uh, you know, that there are strategies that we can apply to support uh, father's participation and services. And so I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. I'm going to just go in the order that I've got my slides here. And I want to highlight a couple of resources for thinking specifically about uh, the diversity of fathers and families and how to engage families in a way that is understanding and respectful of, of families' uh, diversity. So one resource that I want to name for you, and, and as Judith said, we'll post these slides, you'll have the link, is the Diversity Informed Tenets for Work with Infants, Children, and Families. So um, this is a resource that I recommend checking out. I've got the tenets listed here, but if you go to the website, you can read more elaboration about what these tenets look like in practice and what it means to um, really bring these tenets into your work and have these ground and, and uh, orient the work that you do. So you'll see things here like honoring diverse family structures, like supporting families in their preferred language, um, working to acknowledge privilege and combat discrimination. So I encourage you to check out the tenets and to see these as a resource for your work with families. 
I also want to highlight, and there's a link here to a really terrific report that came out um, in 2021 from the Harris Professional Development Network Fatherhood Engagement Committee, um, a, a really terrific concept paper on fatherhood. And I pulled here just a few of the recommendations that they make that speak to our topic today. So one of their recommendations for programs is to advance equity in parenting outreach and engagement by using more inclusive gender neutral terms, a broad diversity of caregiver images, and they elaborate just thinking about the many dimensions of diversity that you can bring to pay, bear in your program materials and your programming in the work that you do. Uh, another recommendation that they make is ensuring that fathers and uh, services for fathers and male care caregivers are respectful of and aligned with cultural values, principles, and practices of the population served. Uh, programs should articulate an explicit commitment to eliminating gender, racial, and class bias. So, uh, you know, so again, here, thinking about getting to know the communities that you're working with and understanding the cultural values, principles, and practices that shape their parenting and their family lives. And then the, the third recommendation that I pulled is advocating for increased investment in evidence-informed, culturally competent co-parenting programs. So uh, thinking about the importance of co-parenting and, and that programs be responsive to a variety of family structures and, and cultural norms and values. So another resource that I encourage you to, to check out. So I, I wanted to just move briefly to talking about a few strategies, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Daryl Davidson, who's going to go next. Um, you know, a piece of this work, I think, is thinking about preparation and training. So thinking about if you're working, um, you know, in a particular community context, you know, what what you need to know and your staff needs to know about the communities that you're serving and bringing in the, the training and preparation that you need. Uh, learning about what fathers are looking for and tailoring your programming to, to meet and be responsive to those needs. Uh, thinking about specific barriers that fathers might face to participation and how you can support them in overcoming those barriers and making uh, programming accessible. A uh, connection with other fathers is often something that fathers are looking for. And so thinking about in your services, you know, are there ways that you are bringing fathers together to exchange support? Uh, recognizing that it's really important to consider who's doing the outreach and who's providing the services, or, or fathers seeing that there are, um, uh, you know, males on staff or male alumni of the program. Is there something that signals that this program is meant for me and I'm not, um, you know, stepping into a program that calls itself a parenting program, but really seems to primarily serve mothers and be staffed by women and where I might be unsure of my fit or my place in the program. And then another thing is to think about support and referrals to quality, culturally sensitive community resources. So, you know, being attentive if you're making referrals that you're sending people to uh, organizations that are going to really be responsive to their needs. So with all of that in mind, um, I am going to now uh, turn it over to Daryl Davidson, who's going to share based on his work with the Milwaukee Fatherhood Initiative what some of this looks like in practice. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you very much, Tova, and welcome everyone. Uh, we really appreciate you being here and we look forward to you know, the questions that you'll be sending to us as we progress. I'm going to introduce who we are as the Milwaukee Fatherhood Initiative, which is a collaborative effort. It started between the city of Milwaukee mayor and it exists that way today. We have a fiscal relationship with the Wisconsin Community Services Incorporated formerly Wisconsin Correctional Services. And that has a very interesting strategic um, benefit because we're able to access now fathers from extremely different backgrounds as well as in various circumstances. And the diversity that we're, we're encountering is um, almost in, indescribable. Uh, there's numerous partner organizations that we've been working with for close to 20 years now that assist fathers, they're prioritizing fathers that may not have necessarily been in their mission statement, but ultimately, if within the context of the organization's goal, they were trying to um, make sure that children thrive, we wanted to approach them as partners. So the core belief is that there's a positive relationship between the children and the fathers based on the involvement of the fathers because that's what strengthens children, families, and communities. Why don't we go to the next slide? So what we are, it, we're a hub, not only in practice, but now we are a physical hub. We have a building that indicates that we're collaborating with efforts designed to help fathers. And some of these seamless access to the supportive services in our facility include child support services, which comes through the Milwaukee uh, Fatherhood Fire uh, supported program, offender reentry services, which is related to Wisconsin Community Services, workforce development, employee consultation, which is through multiple partners who have the, the skills in developing jobs and giving proper 
direction and guidance on how people can uh, develop goals and follow through with those goals. We also have permanent supporting housing, which comes from our relationship with our ho local housing authority, energy assistance programming, behavioral health services, and child development screening, which has always been a part of the Milwaukee Fatherhood Initiative. Something else that's not listed on the slide, we have a strong relationship with our public school system. There's an entity known as the parent coordinators and through that office, we work with them. They facilitate activities between parents, between teachers. They also work with the uh, parenting teens or parenting students. And so we have a relationship with them as well as the relationship with the fathers of the, the pregnant girls who are in these, um, these facilities. We have many services delivered, delivered at multiple sites now. So at our WCS contact sites, at our main Milwaukee Fatherhood Initiative site, and also we are conducting classes and coordination of services in schools now. So we're serving multiple services with many different types of students who are coming from various backgrounds. So this includes backgrounds where there may be um, class differences, uh, immunization issues, we have students who are coming from um, uh, areas where they initially began with language barriers. And we also are coming in contact with many individuals who have particular thoughts about parenting or fatherhood based on what they may have learned, but they may be trying to change that and they want to be more engaged than the previous generation. Next slide. So the manner in which we made this happen, we had to develop a diverse support network that empowered the fathers. And in doing so, it's just like recruiting individual clients. We had to recruit organizations that were going to support us as referral resources. And then we also met with those organizations and tried to establish that all of us as a group were going to maintain an open door to diverse fathers in varying circumstances. So if there's a partner organization that is not comfortable or doesn't have the skills or the training to work with a particular subset of fathers. That could be um, the group that we may need to encourage home visiting or the group that might need the, uh, the translator interpreters. Those are the ones that we are working with and we are talking to to make sure that the needs are met for not only the organizations, but it's the, the proper placement of the father at the individual organization. We established referral partners that prioritize where the fathers need support. So this could be youth serving. This could be public health. And if the fathers need health services, we work with our federally qualified health centers if there's any issues around um, the cost. There's legal services abound. So that can include people who may be referred to us through the court system. We also are working with individuals who are coming to us with many questions around family court. We have a good relationship with multiple legal entities, and many of them are no cost. Uh, one of them is the Milwaukee Justice Center, which assists us in identifying appropriate candidates who might be eligible for expungement if they um, were involved in any type of negative activity that now has followed them for years. If it occurred before a certain age, they may be able to assist them. Of course, there's varying social service activity, and that can include credit repair, that can include uh, placement in temporary or even permanent housing, and also assistance with um, what may happen if the person is, is out of a job, something that can then um, assist with establishing some type of financial assistance for them. So the providers work with us to prevail a comprehensive network, and that's what strengthens the fathers, and we are telling the fathers regularly that these services are available and we are asking the fathers to help us guide them to what they need. So it's not a matter of saying this particular referral resource is what you have to take a look at. We give options. Also, when promoting employment and educational opportunities, we are making sure that these educational opportunities and these employment opportunities do have a father-focused element to them. So we're looking for father-friendly workplaces. We're looking for people and organizations that if they don't have it in their mission statement, we take a look at the environment. If the environment is um, set up where it has images of families or images of fathers and has um, literature for the fathers, um, or if we need to provide that literature for that 
that office or that waiting room, we, we're happy to do so. We have a good relationship also with maternal and child health programs because at varying ages, these programs are going to make sure that they have a relationship with the fathers, no matter what it is, even if fathers are non-custodial dads or they may be fathers who are just getting to know their children, even after four or five years and the families of the child from the mother's side wants to, to reestablish a connection with the father, we're there for that too. So we talk to those dads and in this case, the moms about building trusting relationships and showing the fathers that they are not only valued, but they're needed and they're respected. So we do operate and allow the fathers to tell us in their assessments, what are the boundaries of a particular culture or in their life circumstance, how far they um, want to go with a relationship that may be a past relationship that they're not um, involved in right now, but we are concerned about what's the relationship with the fathers and the children, and we keep promoting that. Let's go to the next slide. And so that's the reason why the fathers are the ones who co-lead these conversations. We have multiple sessions and they, they have a different look. Some of them are held in barbershops where we're calling it Real Men, Real Talk. And in those, we are uh, demonstrating that we can have the fathers lead those conversations. So they are the ones who are assisting us with delivering the surveys and also developing what the conversation and the discussions are going to be about during those evenings. And then we have other events that take place, such as the one tomorrow at our, our facility, where we are the ones who are designing what the conversation is going to be about so that the fathers can begin to think about some life circumstances that they may have conquered, but because they've conquered them, they don't necessarily see them as a challenge and may not relate to other people perceiving them as a challenge. So that's when we get into the conversation about having the fathers not only talk about how they were able to overcome challenges, but also we discuss systems and how to navigate them and what they believe are appropriate in their circumstances, solutions that we can help them and inform them on. Remember, this is what we do because the fathers are the ones who are leading our discussion in most cases. We get their advice and their guidance too. As they express to us, they are the ones who um, have developed this and we are the ones who are facilitating it. So to make sure that we have a father-friendly environment, we ask these questions. Are there messages in your offices or in your environment that are reflective and reinforcing fathers and what fathers believe in or what fathers uh, prioritize? And has your organization assessed the attitude of inclusion of fathers in your program? So once again, we can go back to in your mission statement or in um, something that may be outside of your routines. Are your staff aware that fathers of value? Is that the culture? Do you have trainings in place to support and empower father engagement? And if you do not, do you know how to access them? Do you have numbers or names or websites where even if you have to do it remotely, you can participate in father engagement training. Is your agency or program ready to engage fathers as partners in its work? So in other words, the manner in which we're doing it, we're bringing in fathers who are functioning as an advisory team. And we have the advisors introduce topics to us that we may not have necessarily thought about or even they discuss what they might have seen at our Real Men Real Talk sessions and will identify something that perhaps we need to explore. So are we including these fathers on our advisory committees and focus groups? And when we are doing that, are these fathers diverse? Are we picking fathers that we're comfortable speaking to all the time? Or are we talking to fathers who sometimes they might rub us the wrong way or they seem very, um, they seem very enthusiastic, but at the same time, it doesn't really match all the time. What we're thinking about is the appropriate way a fatherhood program should go, but maybe they are going in the right direction and we need to be open to their suggestions. Do we also have policies in place to support father engagement and involvement and partnerships? So we wanna make sure that those practices, and they don't necessarily have to look the same at each individual agency. But what we want to do 
is include those fathers in the discussion and ensure that we do follow up to make sure that the fathers are getting what they need in those discussions. So if we don't have the infrastructure, can we partner with organizations that do and then make arrangements to work closer together so that the inclusion is considered right at the beginning? So Tova, you can go to... Thanks so Alex much, Daryl. Yeah, yes. we are gonna transition to Alvin Thomas now. Thanks, Daryl and, and Alvin, turning it over to you. Great, thank you very much, Tova. And thank you, um, IRP, for this uh, opportunity to share with you some of the work that we've been doing um, and which kind of dovetails really nicely with the work that Daryl and Tova and many others are doing with regard to fathers. So at the eve of Juneteenth, 2022, and the intersection with Father's Day of that same year, we, we launched the Black Fatherhood Podcast. And the idea behind the Black Fatherhood Podcast is three words. Well, it's actually one word that makes up three words. It's E-V-E, Eve. And so we thought it's the eve of concern or greater concern or increased awareness of the struggles but also the successes of Black fathers in America and beyond. And the EVE stands for educating, validating, and elevating. That's educating, validating, and elevating Black fathers. And the idea is to take, to grapple with the current uh, perceptions of Black fathers, neg negative perceptions, pernicious, historical, stereotypical perceptions, of black fathers and their roles in families. And to join the, the, the fray in both controlling that narrative and changing and rewriting that narrative so that black, the, the, the full reality of black fathers uh, becomes evident. So the idea behind the podcast was essentially to also translate a lot of the literature. So some of the work that Tova has done and other researchers have done uh, gets um, re reflected in the podcast, and we wanted to to make it in a, to to make it such that it would be both palatable and accessible to the ordinary father, but also to researchers and to policymakers and to community practitioners and to other kinds of providers, from teachers to uh, um, early childcare providers to therapists any individual who happens to work with families and work with fathers specifically, we assumed, would be able to benefit from some translation of the research into common everyday conversation. We hoped it would also be, become a resource. Uh, so I did therapy for quite a number of years, specifically with families and very often with Black and underrepresented families. And very often I would find free community resources that individuals could use as a subsidization of the therapy that they were getting with me. And I thought of how we could make this podcast a very similar thing. And so you'll notice that on here, uh, we have a number of different platforms that the podcast currently lives on. Uh, if you scan that scan me QR code, it will take you to the lab website. It will take you to our um, Instagram page, our Twitter page and to the anchor um, spot for the, for the podcast. And I tell you that so that you could actually try to scan it now, because what we hope will also happen is that if you know of a person or you are a person who you think would be really great to add a voice to this podcast or can add something unique and interesting and useful to this podcast, feel free to use any of those spaces to leave that feedback for us. Send us an email or something, or send us something on Twitter or on Instagram uh, saying, hey, I know this person, or let me connect you with this person who might be great to add to your podcast, and we will definitely take a look at it and feel how we could fit them into the next uh, two seasons of the podcast that's being currently considered now. If you could um, advance the slides, thanks, Tova. So who is listening? Remarkably, all, uh, towards the beginning of the podcast, we were releasing two podcasts every, every week, and we had about 75% men. Uh, and this was like about maybe generally the ages of 22 to 45. So a lot of men were listening. We, I'm, I'm not sure if we necessarily had a breakdown 
of race, but we knew a lot of men were following and listening to the podcast. And then we the, the season kind of went through and we weren't posting any new podcast. And then we saw a jump, uh, a switch, a jump in the number of women who were listening to the podcast, where now we have, I think, about 89% uh, women listening to the podcast versus men. And so I think what that tells us is, is what we found in a different study, that men often would, would argue that uh, with regard to finding services and finding resources in the community, often they have lots of difficulty finding those resources. And when they finally find a resource that really connects to them, they jump in fully ready to, 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 to engage. And then suddenly months after or years after that resource disappears and they feel like they were left all, all, all alone all over again. And so we saw that playing out even with the podcast, that for, the, for, for about five or six months, the podcast was up and running and was, it was providing really good resources for men. And then we weren't, providing, we weren't providing new episodes every week. And so eventually the guys kind of left. And so what we're hoping is that in the second and third um, seasons, we have about 44 episodes that we have planned out, that we're planning out. Um, that that will be rolled out over two years and that will give fathers enough opportunity to connect and have some, of, some kind of continuity to the resources. So as you're thinking of the kinds of resources that you're making available or that you have available for fathers, think about the continuity of those resources. Any break in continuity usually causes some flustering with regard to the level of trust that for our level of reliance that fathers feel that they can have on resources. So again, being very careful about that. Um, thank, no, you, you, you're right over, advance to the next slide. So with regard to which episodes, previous slide, which episodes are the most popular? Currently, the most popular one is Behind the Scenes, where myself and my graduate student, Eric Crawford, who helped with uh, um, pulling this, part, this project together, sit back and talk about the usefulness of the podcast and what we want to see the podcast being able to do going forward. So Richard, the, 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 the other episodes of the podcast are specifically uh, researchers, community members, and community partners from around the country who are coming in and providing historical lens on what fatherhood looks like and giving us a really good grasp, both statistically and research-wise, about what father's stories have been and continue to be. And then that episode with, with, with Eric and myself, we spend some time kind of processing and debriefing the experience of creating these episodes and the experience of having run through these episodes and the stories, the deep stories that we hear from fathers talking about some of the um, reflections that we get from the listeners to the podcast. We had one, one woman from, um, from a small town, I won't mention the small town because you know exactly who she is, in Wisconsin, well, somewhere around Bayfield, I'll put it that way, um, who talked about how even as a white woman, she saw herself and saw her father's story in the podcast, even though her father was not a black man and she was not a black person, she saw the common humanity that existed in the stories of these fathers. One of the most iconic episodes across the podcast, or two of them are one, the meaning of fatherhood, where we have a number of fathers come in uh, in this podcast and talk about their specific stories, their challenges through fatherhood and what, what it means to be a father. And then for the other one, we had um, man, parent, black, that intersecting identity. Having professionals and fathers professionals who are also fathers to talk about how it feels to try to undo that trifolded braid of identity, the identity of being a man in America, the identity of being black in America, and the identity of, the, of taking up that fathering role and how individually the weight of each of these identities, but collectively the intersecting and intricacy of those three identities and what it means for the lives of black fathers. If you could advance to the next slide, um, Toba. Thanks. Beyond this, we wanted to kind of get a feel for the reach. So we were really excited when uh, Feedspot reached out to us and said, hey, uh, at one point in time, we were number six 
And again, because we did not continue with uh, multiple episodes over the last year, we kind of fell down to number 15, which is still pretty good when you, when, when you think of the number of podcasts that are out there. And so what it's telling us is that there is a space for this work, that the story of Black fathers needs to be told. The narrative around Black fatherhood needs to be rewritten by Black fathers themselves and by Black women and by Black families themselves. If you can advance to the next slide. And so we think of the Black, okay, we think of the Black Fatherhood podcast as a resource for fathers. So when fathers cannot find resources in their community, fathers may be able to come together, whether it be in person or virtually and say, hey guys, let's listen to this episode on what a Black father is and listen to what these people are saying and then come back and talk about where we see ourselves in these stories or what additional do we need to add to these stories from our own experiences. So fathers can use the Black Fatherhood podcast as a resource for themselves. Other organizations can use the Black Fatherhood podcast to kind of be able to do some of that deep level analysis that uh, Dara was talking about, thinking about where we are with regard to how we want to engage fathers. Great uh, uh, desire, but are we actually moving towards the desire? Do we actually have the knowledge to be able to move from desire to actual uh, fulfillment of that desire? And you may be able to find some, some uh, support for, for that through the Black Fatherhood podcast. I'm hoping that we'll have some time towards uh, the end of the presentation to talk a little bit about other ways that policymakers, researchers might find sustenance from the Black Fatherhood podcast and think of different ways to expand the stories of Black fathers and to el elucidate the lives of Black families. Thank you so much, Alvin. Uh, Christina, we're gonna turn to you next. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I really am honored to um, be on this panel. It's quite some folks to follow, but I will do my best. I am offering kind of the point of view for Latino dads. Um, and so I wanted to give you all some background. Um, Hispanics, we currently make up the largest uh, ethnic and racial minority in the U.S. And Latino children are making up one in four children in the U.S., um, and we are projected to reach one in three, similar to non-Hispanic white children um, in the future. Again, Hispanics are a huge group. And so um, under the large umbrella of Hispanics, the lar three largest subgroups are Mexican-American, followed by Puerto Rican, followed by Cuban-Americans. And so depending on the communities you live in, you may be working with some uh, kind of very different and diverse um, Hispanic Latino fathers. Um, we disproportionately experience higher rates of poverty, unemployment, and segregation. A third of all Hispanic children in the United States are in poverty more than any other racial or ethnic group. The majority of Hispanic fathers are living with all their children, 73%, and with their partner, 82%, and few have fathered children with more than one woman, and most are employed, eight, around 90% of the dads are employed, yet most are low income. Most Hispanic fathers, around 64% are immigrants and half are Spanish dominant speakers. Next slide. So I know a lot of the um, folks joining us today are from Wisconsin, which is not where I'm coming from. So I wanted to give just a quick background. I won't read all of these points, um, but Latinos are the second largest and fastest growing minority and racial ethnic population in Wisconsin. Um, and it's growing and booming. Two thirds of Wisconsin, Hispanic and Latino population is concentrated in Milwaukee, Dane, Racine, Kenosha and Brown counties. And the Latino population in Wisconsin is relatively young, around 25 years of age, um, compared to 38 for your state's uh, population. I won't read the rest of the stats, so we can move on to the next one. So how are Latino fathers involved in their children's lives? We know that compared to white dads, so Latino fathers are more involved in physical play, things like peekaboo, um, wrestling, more kind of hands-on physical um, play, and encourage more risk-taking than the moms, and tend to use higher quality language and interactions with their children than Latino moms. 
We also know that Latino dads can buffer some of these negative effects of maternal depression that may occur um, and cause infant distress in, the, in young children. Latino mothers are reporting that their children, the children's fathers are highly engaged. Um, they're accessible, they're responsible, they're involved with their children's lives, they're doing caregiving, discipline, they're involved in certain decision-making activities. So a lot of folks on this panel have talked about the importance of fatherhood identity. Um, and that it's an important kind of idea or construct that we know um, can hold a, a kind of a turning point for Latino dads, that um, holding the idea that they're a father can be very important um, to their overall identity. So you might identify as a son, as a student, or as an employee, but the fact that you're a father can help kind of ex create a barrier from maybe negative experiences that have been happening in the past. And we know some like new dads might be considering um, a break from maybe substance use or gang involvement or other negative behaviors because they're a father. And so stressing the importance of being a father, of identifying as a father can offer a lot of benefit. Let's see, next slide. Okay, so I wanted to talk quickly about some um, important cultural values um, for Latinos and Latino families. Um, we know that the family or familismo is an important um, cultural value for Latino fathers, that feelings of loyalty, solidarity, um, as, and the family as an extension of itself are extremely important. Um, if a few research studies have shown that Mexican American fathers who hold high va family family values or that they are highly invested report being more involved in interacting or monitoring of their kids or in their children rather than fathers that have low um, values in the in this domain. Latino mothers and fathers who kind of highly believe in this cultural value of familismo um, believe, have better outcomes for their children overall and better psycho psychosocial functioning, um, and they have fewer depression system, de depressive symptoms themselves, and their kids uh, are involved more in their kids' schooling. So I wanted to talk briefly about machismo, um, and it often gets a bad rap in the Latino community. And so there is kind of this kind of traditional machismo, which can often be given more kind of a maleness, masculinity, kind of stereotypical viewpoints. But there's this other kind of domain, which we call, which we consider called caballerismo, which emphasizes this idea of being a provider, that you are trustworthy, that you have courage and humility and fathers who hold this kind of less kind of traditional gender roles um, are more involved in aspects of parenting like supervising their kids or monitoring what the, what their children are doing and so um, I think kind of seeing machismo as kind of like a broad view will often benefit fathers. And the last piece is this idea of respect, which often can kind of color the parenting activities um, for fathers. Um, the work that I've done have sh has shown that, you know, even though respecto in Latino families um, is felt very, that fathers feel that it's very important that they are respected in the family, that it is actually very much a bi-directional relationship, meaning that it's not only they feel that they need to respect, respect from their children, but that they also respect their child. And so um, this is a quote from one of our father participants, um, it's translated to age does not matter because for that word respect, age does not exist because an adult must not disrespect a child nor a child to an adult. And we heard lots of stories from our Latino dads talking about, you know, not maybe disciplining in public that they might take the child, you know, to a different location um, and talk about the behavior rather than disrespecting their child in public. Um, but that, you know, that this, this idea of respect is both bi-directional from the father to the child and the child to the father. Okay, next slide.
Um, these are some quotes um, that we heard from dads. Um, the one underneath the picture says, I think the key in everything is talk to me, I listen, I talk to you, you listen. Um, that they're highly engaged with their children. They want to um, play with their kids. They want to learn about their kids' interests and their abilities. Um, and that they feel often disregarded in a lot of um, service provision. This one father says, when I'm going to the school or I've gone to some community agencies or whatever, I'm with mom. So everything is pointed to mom to mom. And I'm like, I'm here. I know everything about my son. I know how to answer any questions. I take my kids to the doctors. I do everything with my kids, just like mom does. But everything is society is towards mom, mom, mom. So I know you're all on this webinar to hear how to engage kind of dads a little bit more. So I'll give you a, the next slide, which... Yep, thanks. Um, how to uh, better recruit fathers into your programming. And this is from the little tag at the bottom says National Fatherhood Initiative. Um, and they offer a lot of great tips. So we've used maximizing word of mouth marketing. We've asked Latino dads to go out and bring a friend back that would fit, you know, be a Latino dad that would want to be involved in some of the programs we have to offer. We've offered incentives for doing that for, you know, gift cards. Um, and so forth. We've asked community partners that like Head Start or Early Head Start or other social service agencies or schools to refer fathers that might want to come and be involved in our programming. We've gone out to where dads are. So that might be different in every community, sports arenas, community centers, um, sporting goods stores, repair shops, um, places where you can find dads that might be interested in your program and recruit them. We think it's really important. It's worked really well for us to staff program with programs with men um, as facilitators. A lot of times they are graduates of our programs and want to come back and help facilitate. Oop. Could you go back? Sorry. Um, and we also um, are asking for referrals on special, like it, important, you know, issues. Um, and we'll have we'll offer things like legal assistance for fathers. You want to provide incentives that are valuable to the dads, and that depends on your dad. Sometimes we found offering them diapers, depend, you know, and that's a great bartering tool for their um, with for the moms or their partners. Um, we've offered gift cards for activities with their kids. They really like that. Movies, um, taking them out to mini golf, whatever's around in the community. Okay, next slide. Um, so again, just tailoring interventions to include the dads, figuring out what motivates them and engages them. We found that, you know, if they come to the first three sessions of our programming, they're likely to stay. And so we've offered in heightened incentives to come to the first three sessions. Um, and we've really kind of built up fatherhood as their identity within the programming to stress that piece. And then also to stress cultural values that are important to Latino dads, the importance of the family, the importance of being a provider, having courage, humility, and having respect for and to their children. And then finally, I know we're, we want to get to questions. So I will go um, to the next slide to just let you know, we have. I am the editor in chief of Families and Society, which is um, a journal and social work, and we have uh, put together a small collection of articles that focus on fathers and child and family services. Um, I can put the link in the chat as well, um, and we are opening up these articles for the month of March, so you can read them because I know sometimes there's a paywall barrier for for folks. That's my ten minutes. Well done. <laughs> I kept it perfectly to uh, 10 minutes. So I'm going to stop. Actually, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and we are going to move into discussion mode. But I'm going to just name for you uh, a couple of things that are in the slides that will get sent out to you. Since I saw some questions coming in about sharing photos or links that went by really quickly. So I want to let you know we're going to email you the slides afterward and they will include you know, all of the links. Many of the pictures in this presentation can be found through a really wonderful resource, the Diversity of Fatherhood Photo Bank. I put a link in the Q&A. It's also in the slides. Um, and so just want you to know that that is coming your way if there was something that you're wondering where to find. Contact information for all of the presenters is also in the slides. So if there is a specific question you wanted to ask that we don't get to today, you're welcome to reach out to us afterward. 
Um, and with all of that said, we're going to turn to some of your questions. Um, I want to start with, there, there's a question that came in a, a couple of times through the Q&A box, so you may have seen it, my fellow panelists, but questions about thinking about gender and inclusion and the right language to use and how to be inclusive in groups for fathers. So, um, so I'm going to share a couple thoughts, and then I want to open it up to you all to hear what you think. I shared one recommendation from that Harris Foundation report where they suggested using gender neutral terms. And I want to say that I'm actually not sure I agree with that recommendation for a particular reason, which is that in some of the work that I do with fathers, I hear that it's really important to them to hear the word father said out loud and named, or they don't know if it's for them, that they've had enough experience of, you know, going to a parenting group or being told it's for parents and being the only dad in the room and feeling like actually maybe I'm not really meant to be here. So I think it can be important to name if a program um, is intended to include dads to name, name that explicitly. Um, my own thoughts, there was a question that came in about, you know, thinking about, um, transparency and, and, and welcoming them into fatherhood groups. You know, I think fathers are those who I identify as fathers. So I think about this in terms of biological fathers as stepfathers, that grandfathers who are raising their children and playing a fathering role. If I was leading a fathering group and you know, someone of any gender, of any biological or not biological relationship, you know, whatever the dynamics of that relationship, somebody who identifies as a father and is playing a fathering role in the life of a child, want to support their fathering, want to support their father-child relationship. So that's kind of how I think about that question. But I would love to hear, um, you know, from others on the panel, do you think differently about that, you know, how you think about this question of, of naming fathers, of defining fathers, of being inclusive in programming? Thank you, Tova. I, I'd like to start off by saying, much of what you were saying, I, I do concur. I also believe that much of what we're doing is about promoting the images of fathers too, which we haven't done as, as often as we probably needed to in the past. So it didn't matter necessarily about the age or even the race or the class, or even in this case, when we were talking about maybe a transgender situation, what we want to do is promote that the word father is what we're leading with. And so, because I don't believe my organization is changing its name, but we do want to show that there's a broad spectrum of what's representative of the father in various types of families. So yes, if it's an uncle or if it's the grandfather, if it's the stepfather, if it's the person who is the most influential um, figure for that child who's identifying themselves as a father, we want them to talk to us. We want to work with that individual. Thanks. So another question that came in, I'm going to, I guess I'll just keep us moving because we have so many wonderful questions that I want to get to, um, is about engaging fathers specifically in the context of child welfare. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, if folks have advice for thinking about how to include fathers, and um, I can look to the specific language of the question, but we got several as part of registration and one that came in just now asking about, uh, let's see, asking in child welfare, foster care, kinship care context. Um, how speakers would recommend uh, ensuring that dads are equally involved in co-parenting and decision-making. Um, thoughts from anyone on the panel about that? Would anyone like to take the first pass at this one? I think one thing that I would say is I would just offer, a, you know, a couple of examples of places that are making change that you might want to look to. So Los Angeles County in particular is doing some really um, innovative things in expanding engagement of fathers and child welfare. First of all, they've really revamped all their forms. So, you know, in many places, um, you don't necessarily have to list a father's, you know, information on your intake forms. And so already you're starting kind of behind the curve with engaging fathers if you're not thinking about fathers from the get-go. So they've kind of done a careful audit of where are all the places kind of procedurally where we can really make it happen that fathers are, are very um, front of mind. Um, they are also part of a project with... Um, uh, in partnership with Mathematica and some other uh, child welfare agencies, um, looking at ways of, of really uh, expanding engagement of fathers in child welfare. I'll find that in just a second and put a link in the chat, but some of you might be interested to read about that project and look at some of the examples of how, um, how uh, different child welfare agencies are trying to make change in that domain. But I would say a starting place is just thinking about where are all the places that we are you know, bringing people together, thinking about who's a stakeholder and are we making sure that dads are included um, and not secondary? Are we thinking about paternal relatives as resources and making sure that, you know, they're front of mind too if we're thinking about placement options along with maternal um, relatives to kind of maximize, you know, bringing to the table everyone who, who cares about and has a connection to the child. 
Um, yeah, okay. I put in, I put yeah, in some Christina. links. I put in some links for the child Great. welfare information gateway. Um, they have engaging fathers um, and, and like lots of resources there. The other link is for effectively engaging fathers of color. They have some videos. They have a, CS, uh, a discussion guide that they posted that has a lot of different resources. So those, I think, two websites will get get people started. Yeah, thank you for adding those. And thank you to the participants who've added a few other really terrific resources. I can see some great ideas and, and links showing up in the chat. Um, so one question that came in was, um, I was thinking about, you know, the terrible disparities that we have in the state of Wisconsin in maternal and child health and thinking about infant mortality and thinking about where do fathers fit into our efforts to close some of those gaps. Um, I think I'll turn to you with that one, Alvin, if, if you maybe want to name some of the work that we've been doing in Milwaukee, thinking about how fathers are a part of, of the puzzle and thinking about that pernicious problem. So I think uh, we're, thank you very much, Tulva. Uh, we're still, we're still in a space uh, that reflects a lot of the historical views that we had of fatherhood and of parenting, where at one point in time, it was almost impossible for a father to be in the delivery room. And now it's being seen as something that's a little bit more acceptable and almost expected. Um, but in other areas, we still have those same old values, those same old belief systems with regard to where fathers should and should not be. And I think in maternal and infant health spaces, whether we say it or not, there's the implicit assumption, the default assumption, that if we're talking about mother's health and baby's health, that's the mother's, that's the mother's space. And the father can do other, other things, but he can't be in that space. And so uh, last year, myself and Tova, and we, we had, um, we connected with the African American Breastfeeding Network in Milwaukee and did a really great study with them and connected with, uh, that's kind of how I've co connected with Daryl Davidson and the rest is history. Um, but connected with, with, with these organizations in Milwaukee, specifically the African American Breastfeeding Network, to, to hear the stories of Black, new and expectant mothers and fathers. And essentially what we were hearing was, what we were finding from these studies was exactly what we knew all along but we were able to now have tangible empirical support for the stories that we were hearing, that fathers were not being included in those spaces, but there was a very high level of excitement and desire to be included, both from the black fathers and from their spouses. And that's whether they were married to the, whether they were married to the mother of their child or not, they were still in, interested in being involved, but our organizations had either gone through with their default of parent meaning mom or didn't quite know how to make that transition just yet or weren't quite connecting with, with, with fathers. And so the stories of these fathers and mothers uh, from Milwaukee was essentially letting us know the, a really good assessment of where we are with regard to including fathers in these spaces. And we know that there's still quite a bit of work to be done. Thank you. Daryl, I wonder if you want to add anything. I know you partner with maternal and child health programs and how you think about uh, engaging fathers in that work. Uh, yes, thank you. So I'm, I'm very, very much a, a proponent of talking to maternal and child health programs before they see fathers, get the fathers involved in the prenatal discussions, um, get the fathers or the, the soon to be fathers involved in the prenatal discussions, get them involved in discussions around participating in breastfeeding and maintaining that process, have the discussions around plans for what takes place at the delivery and infant care after delivery. So those are the types of coursework that we d deliver to our, or to our fathers when we talk to them about um, the relationship with children, but we also are letting the uh, maternal and child health partners know that not only are we doing that, but we need a corresponding supportive effort from maternal and child health that's going to more or less match the type of information that we're saying, because it's not going, going to do the child any good if you have two completely different belief systems that exist either in a household or in a family environment if the two parents are not in the same household. 
Thank you. So I know we're coming to the end of our time. I'm wondering, Judith or, or Dawn, if you might be able to post um, one more link in the chat. There are a couple of questions that have come in that I think some of the earlier webinars in this series, series speak to. So I wonder if we could post a link to the earlier webinars. A great question about thinking about um, making your environment father friendly and, and other questions here that I, I think um, you might be interested to check out some of the earlier webinars. Absolutely, we're we can do that. We can hour. also set that out in the, in the, yeah. uh, with the slides awesome. and the recording. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it back to Judith now. We're unfortunately at the end of our hour, but I'll remind you that our email addresses will go out with uh, the slides and that we're happy to connect with you if, if some of you have questions that we didn't get to. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Tova. And I just want to say briefly, thanks so much to Dr. Tova Walsh, Mr. Daryl Davidson, Dr. Alvin Thomas, and Dr. Christina Mulgrew Wilson for sharing their time, their experience, and their research with us today. Very informative, clearly um, very well received from the, the many positive comments in the chat. And so, as we did mention before, we will be posting the slides and the recording of the webinar within a day or so, and you'll re receive a link to those by email. We'll also include a link to the Black Fatherhood podcast and to the other webinars. So it'll be a one-stop shop for, for all that great information. So thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.